Hello and welcome to the Southbound Sports Show. I'm your host, Richie Leahy, here with my co-host, Matty B. What a weekend. Uh, I, I can't even put it into words. I know we had, I had a lot of crazy things go on, so we'll start with the Rose Bowl. We were talking about college football in the pre-show a little bit. Michigan, Alabama, New Year's Day, and I think, what, five? It didn't start at five. It started at five ten or something like that. And I don't, I don't even think it made that cutoff. The games took forever. And as you're getting the transfer portal stuff that we talked about, and we're probably going to circle back to, the timing of college football is so weird that I felt like they should have just made this weekend be the national championship game. Push the other bulls back a week so that it's like the weekend before. And maybe it just feels that way because New Year's Day was what, a mon- Monday? And Christmas was like a Monday. So like it kind of would have lined up where all the games would have been not Christmas Eve, but like the 23rd. And then the NFL would have been on Christmas Eve slash Christmas. And then we would have just had the national championship game on the first. And I feel like it would have been awesome because I feel bad for Texas and Washington fans that had to stay up till like one something in the morning, like one, one thirty. I can't remember. <laughs> I'm, I might've had a text because I, I was heavily invested after Michigan pulled out the win against Alabama, which they did everything in their power to make sure they lost that game. It's like every year. I knew that was going to happen. Um, what time? Yeah, ten or twelve fifty four. It looks like. Oh no, I guess it would have been twelve fifty one. Is when I got when I text about the ending of the game, and I thought, man, what a disaster! Like long day for college football. I, I tried to find the TV ratings before the show because we had two great playoff games. We we can't deny that. Um. They tried to they they honestly match it up based on style. So you had Michigan Bama, which were very similar, and then I mean Bama ran the quarterback a bit more; they weren't as pro. But then you had Texas and Washington, more pass heavy, um, air raid stuff. But Michigan came out. <laughs> I don't even want to say flat. They came out all jittery like normal. And JJ threw a pick the first play. They said the guy was out of bounds. And I thought, here we go. Guys are dropping passes, muffing punts. Special teams was awful. Michigan shouldn't even have just had any special teams. They should have went back to the 1960s and just said, you know what? We're not returning punts. It's going to be like Madden. We're just going to keep the defense out there in case they try fake. (laughs) And just let the punt land. Because I don't even know how good the Bama punter was. His average was great. But a lot of it was like Michigan's guy muffing it, going back to the goal line at the end of the game, and almost getting a safety to lose. And it's like, what are you guys doing? What are you doing? Actually, the crazy thing is if that would have been a safety, it really it wouldn't have ended the game because Michigan could have tried an onside kick, I believe. But it was almost like, what are you doing? You could have just... It would have been weird if Michigan would have muffed the punt for a safety kicked an onside kick, and then kicked the game-winning field goal. That probably has never happened, right? Yeah, I don't foresee that. Because that would almost be like an Iowa ending. Because I don't know how... I I think so... And this is random, I'm going to add this in so I don't forget. But I I saw the computers crunch the number on Iowa with their offensive performance in the history of the game. Anyone that's had similar offensive performance, the most games they've ever won... And a season is four. And Iowa somehow won 10. And was the Big Ten champ of the West. And they couldn't even score in the bowl game. You would think they would have just came out and ran the option or something. Like really mixed it up. Nah. They almost scored the first drive and they threw a pick in the end zone. I thought, this is Big Ten football. Because everything was leading up. Everyone's talking about how Michigan's not going to, they're not going to match up with Bama. They're not going to match up. And condolences to your Florida State Seminoles. I'll talk about them here in a little bit. 
But the matchup, having Alabama play Michigan, really saved the Big Ten. And Michigan, to be honest. If Michigan beats Florida State in overtime, no one would care. They would just be saying, like, well, Michigan really lucked out. They're going to get killed in the national championship game by Washington. And now it's like, well, we still think Michigan's going to lose because they didn't look good, but they're going to be the favorites going into the game. I think Michigan's like a three and a half to four and a half point favorite right now, which is a weird line. So that'll probably drop or go up because that's like what a touchdown um, and a field goal, field goal separation. But Bama, now all we hear, because I've read a lot of the recaps, it's about how that wasn't a good Bama team. And I had some I had some stats on that. Bama, according to the team talent composite, is the most talented team in the country. By far. And I think due to the blue chip ratio this year, they have one of the highest blue chip ratios of all time, if not the highest blue chip ratio of all time so it's not that it's a bad bama team it's just that um i don't know if it i don't want to blame it on the quarterback i mean their center i felt bad for that guy (laughs) he i i honestly think that when you go from and i know he had snapping issues all all year but like when you play on turf i think bama plays on turf maybe i'm wrong i know michigan does and they've had issues in the bowl games going from We're playing on turf. We're going to go randomly play on a cold, like half moisturized, muddy field in the Rose Bowl. It's like slippy. Because Michigan, I think, from what I heard, is that after last year's performance where they had guys falling over the field, they had like the Nike rep come down to the Rose Bowl before. And they tried out different spikes this year. And guess what? Michigan didn't fall. But there was one play distinctively where uh, Milrow took a quarterback run, got towards the sticks and tried to make a cut, and he slipped. And I thought, oh my gosh, they didn't, they didn't do the, the field test. <laughs> Their guys are slipping all over the field. Bad look for Nike, right? Because I think that's what they don't want. Their, their like, products out there looking like crap. Because, like, why would you? But... um. In terms of the blue chip ratio, I'm looking to see if I have... I thought they had a graphic on here. Oh, yeah. Alabama had 90% of their team were blue chip guys, which is insane. Like, in, in terms of teams that win the national championship, uh, like they're normally around 60, 70. The highest team that has won it was Bama in 2020 at an 83 clip. This is the most talented Bama team they've had in like forever they've had issues but can you really blame it on the roster because i told a buddy of mine lives in tuscaloosa and we had a talk before the season and i told him like hey if michigan makes a playoff again and we have to play an sec team i'd rather play bama because it kind of seems like saban's on his decline right yes and they were telling me no way you're an idiot. I had uh, Bama guys yesterday. Uh, honestly, maybe I'm wrong because I thought Kirby Smart and Georgia were up, but th- their fans are very convinced that they're still the top of the SEC and that us playing Georgia wouldn't have been any different. In fact, that kept telling me that Kirby Smart's only beat Nick Saban one time, even though they got the national championship. They locked out by playing LSU the other year, I think, right? So, you have Alabama fans that are saying that if we would have played Georgia and beat them, just like that in overtime, I think a lot of the media would have just considered that a fluke win. And getting the opportunity to play Bama, really, it wasn't close. Michigan looked like the better team. Controlled both lines of scrimmage. They had like five sacks in the first half, which is insane. Because I was concerned that our uh, Michigan's not get, they're not going to get any pressure. They're going to be able to just scramble around. And the defensive backs, I was concerned about Will Johnson. He came back, looked 100%. Their, their big-time guy, they threw that one bomb to him. 
Will Johnson was basically running the route for him. And I thought, there's no way they can complete a pass deep on us. And they couldn't the entire game, which is Bama's bread and butter. And ironically, also Washington's bread and butter, right? Because I've been saying all along, passing against Michigan, they're built to beat passing. That's all Ohio State does. I'm not saying that Michigan's going to win against Washington, but in terms of the way the playoffs went with Texas and their blue chip ratio getting eliminated, um, play into Michigan's favor. So Michigan definitely has an advantage going into the game. If they show up with the yips again, start fumbling them off in punts, they'll probably lose. Washington's a great team. Um, but Texas had a 70% blue chip ratio. Michigan's at 54, which would have some winners. I think actually the lowest they had on here might have been, oh, it was Clemson at 52%, their first national championship. Florida State was at 53 with theirs in 2013, but that was before the playoffs. Uh, most of the teams now, since the playoff area hit, the big blue bloods that have been in the playoffs every year, their blue chip ratios has been going up, 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 because Kids want to play in the playoffs. It's very easy to say, hey, so-and-so recruit. Um, you can come to Michigan. We've been in the playoffs three years in a row. And then Penn State, they can't say anything. Come to Penn State, we might make it one time. Or can you imagine the cell now where it's like, hey, guys, uh, we they're, they're expanding the playoffs, so we can probably get in now. But then all the other coaches have to say, is like, look, we're expanding the Big Ten to include... Washington that's been in twice, Oregon that's been in, and you already have Ohio State and Michigan State that have been in the playoffs, why would you go to Penn State at all? And that's a soul-searching question. They have the hypotheticals that Penn State would have been in so many playoffs if it was expanded years ago, but now you have a, a big, big 10. So you don't know. We don't know. That's why the blue chip ratio and some of the talent stuff my only concern is that they don't consider transfers. So, I mean, the only thing that I would say to that is that for for someone considering, like if if you're being recruited and you don't see, you don't get a Michigan offer, you don't get an Ohio State offer. If you're looking at, say, Oklahoma State, you're looking at North Carolina, and you're looking at Penn State, you know, if those are your options you're better off trying to consider one of the trying to get an offer from a big 10 or pack or sec school, because you know, those are the ones that if you have an opportunity to win your conference, you're going to get in the playoffs. And, and I think that's, that's the, the, the recruiting Avenue that you go down, as you say, you you won't be left out and they'll find ways to screw over every other conference because there's not the, the money tied to it and some of the the hype with the games i think is arbitrary because all year and we talked about a little bit last week where you're looking at the sec how do you have so many of your conference ranked in the top 25 at the end of year your conference isn't that good and they said about expanding to 12 expanding to 12 and it would have been six big 10 schools florida state and five SEC schools. So it's not like you're getting this well-rounded pot of diversity. You, when you hyperinflate it at the top, and you're just like, oh, well, these have to be the best schools because they're coming from here, and they're they're using these arbitrary things to de- decide what's going to make that that those positions happen. I think it creates this domino effect that now, with at least those two conferences, you're sitting in a spot where if you lose a game, you're falling, what, two spots? three spots, you know, Florida State will end up finishing the year at like 17 and (laughs) wrongfully so. They won't fall that far. Um, I will say that I I saw a new stat for the first time ever randomly. I I was keeping an eye on how the conferences were doing, try to keep up with my bull picks or whatever. And ESPN threw up this graphic. It was like, SEC is the only team to have, or the only conference to have nine teams in bowl games. And I thought, that's not right. And at the very bottom, I had to get up and look at the asterisks they had. And they were only counting games like after Christmas or something like that. And I thought, <laughs> or 20, after the 26th or something, I thought, why would they put that qualifier in? Because all the conferences have like nine teams. And what's the difference if the ACC plays someone 
like on Christmas Eve versus New Year's or whatever. Because like they try to inflate them as like, hey, we're going to play the big time matchups. But right now, the bowl performance comes down to the national championship game. I think I sent you this. The the current right now, the Pac-12 is leading at five and three. All the other conferences are five and four, except for the ACC at five and six. So if Michigan wins, they'll become six and four. The Pac-12 would fall to five and four and be the same as the other three. Um, or if the Pac-12 wins, then the Big Ten would fall to fourth. All right, yeah, fourth behind the Pac-12 and the SEC, and then they would have a 500 record. So all conferences are very evenly matched here. But again, the bowl games are all kind of evenly matched. And at the top, the opt outs still kill it. But uh, we'll save that till after we I get through the playoff stuff. Um, the other thing, the new Pack Four, like you were talking about, the Big Ten, eight and four, the Big Twelve, six and three, and then the SEC would be five and six, and then the ACC would be five and eight. So with the new guard, they have to be careful the way they're they're doing these bulls because with the Big Ten and all their tie-ins. <laughs> They've all they've always been up because of the Big Ten's large alumni base. I've said this a couple years ago. Remember the year that uh, Ohio State missed the playoffs? The Big Ten went like ten and one in bowl games or something like that that year, nine and one, because everyone was then playing someone consistently around like around or above like below their level. Never they cleaned house. So this year it's like, hey, we're here. SEC doesn't have two teams in the playoffs. They lose in the playoffs, so they're out for the first time since I think Oregon and Ohio State played, which is weird because now their rivals are playing for a championship. Yeah. So, first year of the playoffs in 14. And uh, this is the first time that they haven't had a Southern team since that game. So, we'll have a non Southern champ and a non whatever. I think the. Obviously, Ohio State in 14. Uh, what was USC? Like 05 or 06. Uh, maybe before that, 04. I can't remember when Pete Carroll left and when they had their last one. Because I know they lost the... I think they lost 05. That was the year they lost to Texas. Which would have been the last Big 12 one, right? Yeah. So, n- even if... It doesn't matter. This is an all Big 10 national championship game. I know they're not going to categorize it as that. But if Washington wins as basically a Big 10 champ, they're going to bring into the conference... And because like everyone kept saying, well, Bama lost. Now it's Texas's time. They're going to be in the SEC. It's 2024. That's when Texas joins the SEC. We're going to count it, you know, hyping it up as the Big Ten versus the SEC already. And even if once Michigan won, Michigan plays both Texas and Washington next year. So we'll get a rematch of the national championship game next year, which is going to be crazy in the new expanded conference. But. Um, like I said, just excited that Michigan pulled it out. The line was better defense and offense. They, the Michigan rotates nine defensive tackles or nine defensive linemen, which is insane. And it doesn't help with NIL and big time recruits because the stats are kind of cut in half then, but boy, does it keep them fresh. Because Bama's line was just destroyed. That last play in overtime, fourth and three, they did a fake like screen, and it was supposed to be a quarterback like misdirection run. And they had the the lineman. I think the guard was pulling. The tackle was blown up so bad that he tackled the quarterback. If you watch the play in slow mo. Milrow tripped over his right tackle. He got pancaked by, I think it was Stewart, which is just crazy because that guy's supposed to be a first round tackle prospect. Can you imagine, like, hey, come meet with us for the NFL draft? Here. Let's look at this play here. Game's on the line. You're getting killed. <laughs> like, you tackled your quarterback here, buddy. Because <laughs> everyone said, oh, he put his head down. He just dove into the line. But if you look, I think he was supposed to kind of go up and then wait a tad and then cut to the left. 
which they might have had. I mean, Michigan kind of stuffed it all the way around. But when he got up to the line, I mean, he just tripped over his own guy. Because I don't think that everyone, a lot of Bama fans I was talking to, they're saying that uh, it was clearly supposed to be an RPO, and he was supposed to look to the running back in the flat, which Michigan had. He 100% should have threw it. But he because the the outside backer on that was going to be the guy responsible for covering the flat, and he responded late because of the quarterback action. I think if he throws it out, I I I really think that he had a good chance of scoring because the angle to make the play would have been really tough. It would have been close, but the way he ran the route, he went back all the way to the ten yard line, which makes me think he was a decoy. Because if you watch his route. He's not running a screen. He like he wasn't he didn't angle it to the pylon like you would need to, right? The way he cut back to the oh he went all the way back from the three. Like they were at the three when they snapped it, so he was probably like at the six or whatever. He went all the way back to the ten yard line, like even below it. So he would have been throwing that three yards backwards as a lateral. And I I don't think maybe he cut it back because Sandra still blitzed. And he would have been able to get, by the time Milrow, like, turned, he would have been kind of in his face, at least, to put his hands up. So it wouldn't have been a clean throw anyway. And it looked like Michigan's guy had enough time to recover. Because the guy, it looked like the inside cornerback beat his man anyway. So I think it would have been close, like you were saying. I think if he would have ran the route straight, straight down the line, and he would have been more of like a parallel pass but he he ran it backwards for some reason so i think it was definitely a decoy nick saban said it was a pure run play in the huddle and i i texted you before i i was thinking they were going to run it up the middle so i was telling the guy i was watching the game with that well, I, I feel like i feel like with with the way that the flow of the game went it just alabama was relying so much and it, it was like they didn't have that inline tight end or a fullback or H back or someone to consistently help with pass protection. I felt like Alabama was looking at it from this perspective that they have the, all these high caliber athletes and that their, their game plan was just to, to beat Michigan down the field vertically, but they just never had time. They, I mean, they put the quarterback in such a terrible spot because he was consistently having to run for his life. They they had so much pressure, and like I said, the cornerbacks are locked up. Like it's not like Michigan's a scrub team. Like if they're going to get a high profile recruit at Michigan, it's usually like a cornerback or a D lineman, right? <laughs> so like Bama, their guys are usually running backs. Like they have like eight five star running backs. Like what do you need all those guys for? You're not playing them all. But they had some five star guys, didn't they? I think they had the one. A uh, five-star wide receiver from Ban- or from Ohio State, maybe. Unless I'm thinking of the guy that got drafted last year. But, I mean, oh, I felt bad for their... Was it Burton? Who was, who was the one that like looked like he got his hamstring torn right off his leg? <laughs> <laughs> the play before the last one, right? He tried to, like, stretch it out like a cramp, and he couldn't move. <laughs> they, uh, it was like the one where he caught the ball coming back at the three to set up the final play. And it just looked bad. And I thought, man, he's cramped. They they kept saying he's cramping, but I thought he like tore it the way he bent. But some of those guys are in freak shape where they're so flexible that it looks bad. And he, it might be, okay, so I'm hoping that he's all right. Uh, but overall, I was surprised Michigan was able to come back. When you get behind, you're missing field goals. You're, you're missing extra points because you're just not snapping the ball. I mean, snap or not Ohio State. Alabama had trouble stopping the ball the entire game. They had a couple fumbles. Michigan's guy was having trouble. I don't know if it was the field surface or what was different, but it just seemed like it was such a sloppy game. I, I watched the highlights. They didn't have the all the whole game footage up before the show because I knew I missed some going to the alumni tailgate. But the commercials, man, so long. So long. Why? I feel like they're going to lose. That's why I wanted to see the TV ratings. Because they have to lose some people watching, right? 
Because every time I I talk to like a casual guy, it's like, yeah, I don't watch college football anymore. It lost its power. It's like the ratings are still going up. Even bowl season, I can rip on them for being like meaningless. But as long as people are gambling and the numbers are going up, they're going to stick around. It's like a consolation prize. It's going to be like the NIT, right? For college basketball. Where an Indiana fan can be like, hey, yeah, we didn't make the playoffs, but we get to play Kentucky. Awesome. (laughs) Kentucky, December 17th. In Charlotte. Awesome. And then they'll be like, the stadium's empty. (laughs) No one cares. It's on TV. A million people are watching because they're gambling. But that's what I want to see. Like, at some point, there has to be a tipping point. You can't have the game be four and a half hours or whatever it was. I know it had overtime, but that nighttime one started late. was almost four hours because each game, I think, had just under an hour of commercials. Why? Like, why are you doing commercial kickoff commercial? I feel like everyone's talking about, well, they're going to become the NFL. It's like, I hope they do in terms of commercials because the NFL games are much shorter. A lot more action. And the college doesn't need that many breaks. Right? The guy stands on the field if you've never been to a game and he has the red hat or whatever and he goes out there and he times three minutes before the players can get on the field. So then you come back from that And then the players run out and then they do their huddle or whatever. And the clock starts running for like the play clock. So you're already adding extra time because some random jackass has to go out there and and count the clock for the commercial. Because like, I I don't know what else they can do. They have to speed it up. Baseball's doing everything they can to speed up the game. And college football's like, we're going to do the same. We're going to speed up the game. But the games are going to take longer because now we're doing more commercials instead. For player safety, Matt, because less snaps, right? It's like, no. (laughs) How's that player safety? The game's taking just as long. Like, in terms of stress on the body, it doesn't matter because you're standing around in full gear or whatever, running around trying to stay warm, doing all kinds of stuff. Like, I mean, Bama looked gassed at the end. When Michigan marched down the field and they had to do that fourth and two, I don't know how you don't cover Blake Corum. I also don't know how Blake Corum wasn't invited to the Heisman ceremony. He's clearly the best running back in the country. I don't care what you say. Like, did you see him run through like five Bama tackles on the game-winning touchdown? Yeah, but that's not that impressive because USF was doing that to him. He had he had the most touchdowns in Michigan history in one season or, or in his career, and he was the country's leading touchdown guy. It's like, nope, not a quarterback. Don't care. Also, like, (laughs) panics, like, should have won the Heisman. Team undefeated, just throwing lasers out there. (laughs) Nah. Shut up about that, because there's only one player that should have had it. It should have been Jordan Travis, because when one guy gets hurt, you still win your final two games, and they're like, no, they're not the same team. If you're telling me that that, that he meant that much, that it meant the playoff snub, then you say, you're the best player in in America. How do, how do you justify it any other way that he won all of his games, he got hurt, we still won two games, and then they're like, no, nah, you can't be in the playoffs because your quarterback got hurt. Meanwhile, you got Millwar, Millwar in the <laughs> damn Rose Bowl, 16-23, 116 yards, five yards in attempt with no touchdowns and no picks. That's the, the elite quarterback play that you're looking for. Hey, McCarthy hey. skipping passes in the dirt. McCarthy was off. That's his thing. But he did throw that laser through the tip to win the game. And I thought, I can't believe Wilson caught that. Our guys are dropping balls right to him <laughs> the entire game. And then he jumps up and catches it. But but Michigan's receivers, they're just they're they're just regular guys, Matt. That's what I kept hearing from people. They're like, oh, Michigan's they're nothing special. And and they're slow, right? It's not like Morris just caught a pass. And outran three Bama guys, made them look like they're running in quicksand for a touchdown. That I thought there's no way he catches, he takes it to, for to the house, right? Just a crossing route. Who's he think he is, Marvin Harrison? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, holy crap! If Michigan had some guys that just wanted to run crossing routes, man, they'd be unstoppable. That's like dink and dunk. That's right up their alley. Quorum run. Well, I, thought, I thought Michigan game planned well for Bama, and I mean, I, I felt like. Going in, 
I thought there was going to be a little concern with the injuries that you had at the offensive line. Oh, so did I, dude. Did you see Penn State? We're pressuring so much we couldn't even pass the ball. So I thought, well, we're just, we're done, right? Bama's guys are going to at least get pressures on us. And they had one, I think, one sack and one pressure. And they re- they really didn't bring a lot. I think I think their whole th- mindset was let McCarthy pick us apart because he hasn't really shown consistently to do it all year. I think they were doing what TCU did last year. If you watch, so and they they were close. There were a couple of times where they had guys drop back in the lane and try to knock the tip the ball up because they were like, "How many tip balls?" Because I kept saying like, the ESPN had him as like what the seventh overall pick in the draft in their latest mock. I sent it to you guys during the game because I thought he's so inaccurate. You can't be that in the NFL. Like you can just win. But at some point, you can't just be throwing tipped balls. Like in the NFL, those are intercepted. Heck, if Roman Wilson doesn't catch that ball, I don't even know how he jumped and got it. He barely had his hands on it. That should have been intercepted, right? He tipped it right to where the safety was running. And looking at all of the quarterback prospects, there's not there's not one that truly stands out to me as a first round have to have guy. Like I, to, I think with the you take every team in the league, there's not a team that is so hard pressed for a quarterback that I feel like you have to say first round, wherever, take your pick of where they're at. There's not a quarterback that I feel like you draft in the first round in this draft and you can feel comfortable with that pick. Like I feel like you there there's a lot of other athletes and linemen on both sides of the ball that would be that are safer picks that I don't think that you you bet to franchise on one of these guys coming out right now because I think they're develop I think all of them are developmental. Well, JJ would be perfect in a situation where he could like sit for a couple years. Like if the Browns decided Joe Flacco's it, I don't he's super old though. So like, but if you're thinking I can get three years out of Joe Flacco, we're gonna draft JJ in the second round and just have him learn, and we're gonna end the Deshaun Watson experiment. Like, that would be a situation. Like, if he goes to the Raiders and he's, like, uh, going against, like, Aiden O'Connell. Like, he, O'Connell's been pretty consistent. And it doesn't seem like he's really the issue. Like, why would you Why would you want to draft another quarterback and then have a weird quarterback battle? Like, that just seems like a weird draft projection. And, I mean, McCarthy, <laughs> it's him and Jameis right now. They're tied, I think, for the greatest, mo- like, quarterback record in NCAA history. If McCarthy wins, uh, other than two guys that were like in black and white, I didn't see who they were during the game they showed. They were went undefeated. They're they're it. It's J it's JJ and, and Jameis is the top two right now tied. So it's like all right, Jameis came in. He's been solid, but he didn't have a good situation either, right? So it, it comes down to that. You need a good situation where you can kind of learn. Because if he was given like an Aaron Rodgers treatment and he settled in and just focused on working on his accuracy, because the reads are there, he can't get nervous though. At this point in his career, like there's no reason to first play where Roman Wilson's open in the flat that he holds it and tries to make, because he held it trying to make a bigger play, but then just throw it to Wilson in the flat. He was still wide open. He tried to throw it to the other guy for like, what, three more yards? And almost got picked. Luckily, their guy went out of bounds. Maybe he, that's why he didn't see him, because he was standing out of bounds. But you got to show some awareness, dude. That's the one thing that like, kind of scares me. Because last year at TCU, they lost. He threw two pick sixes. I forgot that they only lost by six. He doesn't throw one of them. Michigan wins that game. And they had fumbled on the goal line. This year, they were like, we're going to muff a bunch of punts. You know what's funny, though? The Niners, when Harbaugh was the coach, they lost the game to the Giants because their guy muffed two punts, I think. That's all I kept thinking about. They put the other guy back. He muffed one, too. At the end, I was like, oh, my gosh. Don't put a guy back there. Hardball. And that's usually our strength. I don't think we've really had any special team issues all year. Even kicking has been pretty solid. They missed a field goal. So the field goal, uh, would that have covered the spread? Yeah, would have. I think it was only two and a half or whatever, right? So, because I was thinking if they went to, if they didn't go to overtime and they would have won it. So if they would have made the extra point and won by one, 
they wouldn't have covered. If they had made the field goal instead, they would have covered in regulation. But of course, with the touchdown, then they covered anyway. So, crazy game. The Washington game, the only thing I wanted to mention, and then we'll get to Florida State and then some NFL stuff. The the coaching at the end is atrocious. Uh, I want to call them up, Washington, and see if they need me to be on the sideline on Saturday. Or Monday, whenever it is. <laughs> because, first off, they're throwing the ball when you're up by two scores. Why? What are you doing? You have a workhorse running back. I know he hurt his foot. Which, did you see it? I don't know if you saw the highlights or if you even stayed up for the game. but No. Uh, so it looked like he... he probably broke his foot like a stress fracture like he was fighting through it um so they threw a ball it was like third down they're like we're gonna throw the ball and stop the clock and let texas kick it you know or let texas get it um they kick the field goal or whatever they end up doing they're up by like nine texas gets the ball back goes down the field and I, i've been a critical of stark uh or sarkisian or whatever um i don't know how he keeps failing up Right? Gets a head coaching job at a big time gig, blows it, USC. Uh, they just keep giving him chances. Right? And he makes bonehead coaching decisions where, the, for the first time, I saw him make a good one where they got down in the, the near the goal line and they immediately like kicked the field goal when it got the fourth down. They didn't try to do anything fancy. They said, We know we need two scores. It's a short field goal. I think a lot of coaches, especially in the NFL, I've seen where they're like, We're on the 10 this is our best chance to get a touchdown. It's like, kick the field goal. If you don't get a touchdown here, it's over. This is a chip shot. Why would you put the pressure on your kicker to maybe miss like a 60 yarder when a Hail Mary does just the same job, right? So, unless you have Bama's kicker, which was un- unbelievable, credit to him, um, you just got to go ahead and kick the field goal and then Washington has a chance to run it out. Their stud running back got rolled up on and his foot was like done. He was like crying out there. He was trying to like get up off the field to try to get off. So they didn't have to call a timeout and he couldn't do it. And I felt so bad for him. Cause I thought they're going to lose because they passed on third down and then their guy got hurt. Cause of course, Texas is going to decline the 10 second runoff. So instead of them getting the ball back with 10 seconds, they get it back with 40 and they're just throwing darts Missing guys are just missing the ball, and I'm like, is he, yours? Just, yours just like not hitting these guys. I don't understand. They're wide open. Washington's letting them march down the field. They get all the way down, and I think it's another fourth down. There's one second left, and Washington goes into the worst coverage I might have ever seen, where they had all the guys on the left side of the field, and Texas's receivers one on one on the right. And their guy's like eight yards deep in the end zone. And when he when he broke in live play, the first thing that popped in my head was JJ would have would have won the national championship right now. Like if Michigan was driving down and it's fourth and one or fourth and whatever with one second left, and you have Roman Wilson in single coverage, all he had to do is run a skinny post, and it's a touchdown. Instead, they throw a fade. And the guy just stands there and jumps up and knocks it down. They threw it right to him, Matt. <laughs> Did you see the play? No. Uh, dude, I don't even understand. It's one-on-one coverage. It's wide open. If, even if viewers just lasers it to him, like in Madden at the goal line, that defensive back is not coming anywhere close to stopping it. It's that wide open. He's so far in the end zone and one-on-one that – Throw a back shoulder pass, anything. It's a touchdown. Texas is going to the national championship game. And I thought, did Sark call that? It, like, I, if I was a Texas fan, I probably would have cried. Because it was like one of those plays where it, it slows down in your head watch again. Like, holy crap. That running back, I, I was thinking this running back is going to feel like absolute crap. Because he got hurt and couldn't crawl off the field. And their defense draws up this awful coverage. <laughs> like, and yours, is like, he read it perfectly. And he's like, you know what? Just give him an ice cream truck up there. Boop. 
<laughs> and the, the defensive back kind of got there early. And the people were saying that there could should, could have been a flag there. But I was like, dude, he lobbed it up and he threw it right to him, the defender. So, like, you can't throw a flag because he's there early. He threw it right to him. He had the play wide open. I, that's why I thought that's why Sark's not going to win at Texas. It's like, like Sharon Moore, everyone's been giving him great credit for Michigan. I, I feel like, hey, we have our guy dialed up one-on-one. Their guy's eight yards in the end zone. I feel like, like I said, I feel like JJ would have just, and Roman, they would have just ran the, the the post. Would he have overthrown him? Possibly. But they would have ran the right play. And that, to me, that's coaching. And that's just like Washington fans can't be excited after watching their coaching blunder. They They were up and they tried to do a trick. Let's run the score up play. And the announcer said, I think that just fired up the Texas bench. Because I watch it and I thought, you, what are you doing? Guys, this is a playoff game. Why are you trying to do, like, it was like almost like a Michigan type flea flicker. But Michigan runs a flea flicker every game. It's not even a surprise at this point. It was a surprise that they couldn't get, the, get it off because it was wide open again. And I was like, why is Alabama not prepared for this flea flicker? They run it every game. Uh, so that's why I text you. I'm like, why can't we just run a normal play action? It probably would have worked the exact same, right? Fake it to Blake. He gets the block. You don't have to do the flea flicker stuff. And JJ hits him for a wide open for touchdown. But for whatever reason, they have to do a flea flicker. Washington tried to do, I think Michigan did run the same exact play where the running back got it. And he tried to throw back to Penix. Um, and then Penix tried to throw deep or whatever. Um, and it was kind of open, but they kind of just overthrew Penix, I think, or something. But it was kind of like, ha ha, they were like joking about it after. And I thought, Washington thinks they won this game. And now I think that going, I think that could have been the best thing to happen to them. Where they were like, holy crap, we should have lost that game. Because like Michigan <laughs> played so crappy that I feel like they're going to come out focused. Almost like Georgia last year. Remember when Georgia should have lost to Ohio State? They missed a field goal. And then the next week they had their shit together and killed TCU. I feel like when, whenever Washington did that trick play, I thought they're going to come in thinking that they're just going to goof around with Michigan and they're going to get slammed. I mean, because Washington's basically kind of like the same team in terms of talent that Michigan played two years ago. Blake Corm had three touchdowns. Michigan stomped them. Washington went four and eight that year. New coach, new offensive philosophy. But a lot of the talent level is still the same. So if Blake Corm's running for 70 yards, touchdown runs on you, and your run defense isn't getting any better, and you guys are just goofing around running trick plays and obviously not covering Texas, um, that was probably the best thing to happen to Washington, in all honesty. Them <laughs> almost losing the game. Because I feel like now they have to be focused. At least I would be. I'd be scared shitless. Like, guys, we, we should have lost. <laughs> I don't know how they can watch that play in film study. You have to look it up and be like, how did Texas not score a touchdown on that play? It was so wide open. Uh, like I said, I, I just can't believe it. So Washington coming in, great passing. It's almost like the TCU-Michigan matchup of last year where if Washington can force Michigan to make mistakes – and get into a shootout, they have a good chance of winning. If they play like they played against like Arizona State, where it was like 14-7, to they'll get tired, and Michigan will just pound them. Because there's no way their defensive line is anywhere near the size of Bama's. And Texas, for whatever reason, Matt, they were running like eight yards a carry. They just stopped running the ball. (laughs) And I was like, what are you guys doing? Sark, your guy is toasting them. Whatever, I can't remember his name, uh, Barry or something like that. He had a couple of great catches, too, out of the backfield. And I thought, this. he looked so upset after the game. And I thought, man, I feel bad for you. All they had to do was run you. And Washington was goofing around at that point. Texas would have been back in the game. And they would have been playing to win with more time. But coaching, that's what it is. Bama didn't have the coaching really mistakes. They played a pretty clean game. People can call about the, the end call, but they got to overtime. If he wouldn't have fumbled in the fourth, 
I know Michigan didn't capitalize. Well, there were so many plays that Alabama potentially had where the center snapped the ball in the dirt or over the quarterback's head and put them in those really bad spots where then they were having to dig themselves out of holes. And some of them, it was just bad. Like, I feel like it was bad reads or like no one was open. So it's hard to tell. Uh, that's why I wanted to watch the All-22 to see. Like, there were a couple where I felt like Miller rolled out and he had a guy, but he kind of just like clutched it and then got sacked. And it was like, did, could he have just ripped it? I mean, he threw the one and it was like so well covered. And the Bama fans, like, because there was a, Bama, a lot of Bama fans where I was watching the game, they were like complaining that should have been pass interference. I'm like, you're lucky that wasn't offensive pass interference mugging our guy. Because he ran right under the ball. He could have easily intercepted that. And I, I feel like those shots weren't there. So they really didn't have anything. And all they had to do was like, get outside. They never really were able to get outside. Every time Milrow tried to like, he broke a couple runs, but there were like three other ones I could think of where it looked like he was going to be able to break it to the outside and he just got tripped up. And it was like, he just a tad, I don't want to say a tad bit slow because I know he's super fast, but it was just like Michigan guys were just a tad bit in better position than what he expected, I think. And I mean, credit to them. If Michigan's hearing it all you all week about how Bama's bigger and faster, and then they come out and it turns out that they're not, like I think it has to get in your head if you're Bama. And I honestly, I wonder how much of the center snaps were just, "Hey, I'm getting killed here on every play. I need to snap the ball as fast as I can." Because typically, if you're trying to snap it faster, it's going to come out lower, right? Which is what they were doing. Because even Bama yelled at Milroy. He he yelled at him. I don't know if you saw it on the TV broadcast, but I saw it clipped on Twitter a couple times where Saban was yelling at him that he needs to help a center out because he knew that the center was like, "I got to get the ball out. I'm getting killed." And they never really got him any help. Like like you yeah. said, they never brought any other tight ends in or brought another running back in to like stop it. Like because like, Kenneth Grant's like gigantic, dude. He's like 400 pounds or whatever. If he's punching you in the face every play, of course you're going to snap the ball. Like Mason Graham, that overtime play that he blew up the run play that basically saved the game for Michigan because they had just got to the nine yard line. He took him back to what the 15 or whatever blew right through the center. That's probably why the snap came out low on the last play because he thought, well, I just got killed two plays ago. I got to get it out fast, right? So I think some of that's kind of, I don't know if it's just on Saban, but it's like, you got to put a fullback in if you're going to do a quarterback dive. Don't do the misdirection stuff. And that's kind of like that's saying we don't know if Saban's just saying that it was a run all the way to bail his quarterback out or a center, you know. But if it was, just do max protect, man. Because Michigan's linebackers, like you said, they were they were slow. They were anticipating the quarterback draw. They said that in the in the post game, the defensive line coach from Notre Dame, that I wasn't sure on that hire either, but he said. He said, oh, we had, a, we had a stunt ready for that situation. He said, we, we thought that they might come down to the game where they were going to run a quarterback dive. And he said, we didn't even change out of it. <laughs> so they were calling that play, even though there were three timeouts, Matts. They were like, Bam was running up the middle. <laughs> they, he called it Twister. He said, we had a play ready to go. We're calling it Twister to get the line. They probably didn't think that the guy was going to just pancake their tackle. But... Um, so we got all big 10 final. It'll be exciting. Uh, I'll talk about it next week. I think the college, the one thing that kind of upset me is that the, uh, the, what the committee, I don't know what they call themselves kind of got bailed out. Not so much because of the, what happened in the Georgia Florida state game, but more so that we had two great games in the play in the semifinals. And I thought a lot about this, where if Georgia would have won, and you had four undefeated teams, the national championship game most likely would have been the Rose Bowl, Michigan and Washington, and Georgia would have played Florida State at full strength. But then, like I said, in in terms of like the Big Ten perception, Michigan knocking off Georgia in the national championship game honestly doesn't have the same weight as them beating Bama. Because when Ohio State beat Bama in 2014... I think the narrative's the exact same that you're hearing now. 
oh, that was just a fluke. Like Bama could have just kept running all over them. You know, they they just they just had a bad game, or this isn't the best Bama team. It was, like they should have just kept running Derrick Henry. Remember that? And then they were like, Oregon's going to toast them anyway. And then Ohio State just ran all over Oregon, and it was over. So you're hearing the same thing this year. It's like that wasn't the best Bama team. Uh, Washington's going to pass all over Michigan. Their defense hasn't seen anything like it. It's like, I honestly, I feel disrespected for Ohio State fans. I feel dirty saying this, Matt. But they're saying that, like, C.J. Stroud and Alave and Wilson and Smith and Jigba, like, that wasn't a good offense. That's probably the best offense (laughs) in, like, modern history, right? So they're, but they're like, now nah, this Washington team's better. Michigan's never seen anything like it with their coaching staff. It's like, have you guys not watched Ohio State? Maybe not this year with McCord, but Michigan's guys all came back from last year, right? I feel like the pundits are kind of blind to that. They're like, like they don't realize it's, they maybe because Michigan lost to TCU and the year before with Cade McNamara, they got blown out by Georgia, but these are all veteran guys coming back. Of course they're going to be good, right? That's why with the Georgia thing, of course Georgia's going to be good. They're stacking up blue chips just like Florida State. And well, they are, but I think like the one thing leading up to the game was that I felt like there were so many players from Georgia that were still continuing to play, and I feel like there was more motivation for Georgia to end on a positive note because they lost. The, the SEC championship. They had an opportunity to, to win versus Alabama on the field and earn your place in the playoff, and they lost. There's a logical explanation as to why they didn't get in. So for, for those guys like to want to finish the year out, I understand because they weren't going to have an opportunity and shouldn't have because they weren't the conference champ. It logically made sense. But see, that's where I'm disappointed in Florida State, dude. Because, like, I was saying all along, I had a feeling this is going to happen. I told you, pick Georgia for sure. Because all right, but time out. Time out. Go ahead. Take, the, take the, the high of high that you're feeling right now with Michigan. They're undefeated. They're conference champ. If they would just be like, eh, fuck it. Put, <laughs> put Michigan at five. How many guys that that played in that Rose Bowl game are going to stay and play in a bullshit who cares bowl? Well, see, that's the thing. ESPN was trying to push on the narrative, but they were saying that Michigan should have been banned altogether. And that's where I think Florida State, that's why I said all along, if Michigan would have just taken the ban or whatever and said, we're undefeated, we're going to claim it. That's what I wanted to see Florida State do. By they had to have known that their players were up and out. They did the worst thing for their brand. And instead of just declining the bid, which would have been like, I think I talked about it, it would have been like a $4 million hit for the conference. I don't think there's any penalties for declining a bull bid. All they had to say is like, look, we got 20 guys opting out ACC. We have to decline. It's going to be a bad look for us if we play. I think the conference would have been like, all right, we understand. Instead, what I end up seeing is ACC members cheering that Florida State's getting killed because they don't, they don't care. They didn't like the way that Florida State's been trying to leave the conference. But and I you told know, you even before that they've never it's never been anything supportive since well, they've entered, and they've carried the water for years. Oh, Matt, I've seen the same thing in Michigan. Did you know people were at the Rose Bowl wearing Ohio State fan cheering for Alabama shirts? Yeah, that was kind of, that was embarrassing. Isn't that um, weird? <laughs> and, even, and even like when Florida State was down and Clemson had their run, it wasn't like oh, we're ACC, ACC. Like we do, we we said it tongue in cheek, but I don't want Clemson to to win. <laughs> I want them to lose every game. I know that's why it's funny because like I saw a lot of AI pictures of like Michigan State guys like holding Alabama flags and stuff, and it's like, why? What do you get? I know it's like Michigan State's worst loss was uh, Alabama losing the Rose Bowl this year. It's like, <laughs> oh, good grief! Little brother doing but, little brother things, right? So, but but I think it helped in terms of leading up to the bowl prep. I felt like it it helped 
the freshmen early enrollees get some extra practice time that if you opt out of the bowl, you don't get. So I feel like you take advantage of those extra practices and having those opportunities for the team to be together. They have those extra bowl, like sponsored dinners and team things that I think the successful teams take advantage of. And you're, you're, you're enjoying the spoils of, of having a successful season. See, but here's my thing now, because that's where I think the Florida state, like they got killed because the locker room had to be split. You had guys that were going on the trips, doing all the fun things that were then just standing on the sideline in like street clothes. Like they should have been like, Hey, if you're not going to be here, you're not going to come to the the team things anymore. Like we're going to get some walk-ons in here. Or do something because I feel like to me, and I'm just an outsider, but looking at the program, I don't see how this doesn't hurt them going forward because it's the same thing that TCU went through. They're locked. Guess what, dog? It doesn't because we just signed Ugalele. He's not a savior. He's on his third team in whatever years. But he made he made Oregon State into something. He contributed to Clemson. He's going to give us signals for Clemson. So there's another win. Uh, Connor like, Stiens was at the Rose Bowl. Did you see that? But I, I, but I think like that's those are the things that you would think that it doesn't matter. But the recent success that Florida State's had the portal cycle in, cycle out. You're going to get the guys that you need. I think it's a matter of being able to show and the track record of Florida State over the last couple of years is that they'll take guys from the portal and develop them into top prospects and it's not it's not like with a lot of the i mean they had 20 some guys or close to 30 some guys between the nfl and the portal go out like they had nothing to prove so so you beat georgia and all it is is well you won your game like there was going to be no extra credentials and the dorito eaters in this are like see they got destroyed by georgia playing their third string team like you can't even compare what was going on in the field. And I feel like for the players that opted out, it was good for them because that was the best way of protesting. Take that $4 million check, give them an absolute blowout of a game that means nothing. It gives people stuff to talk about, but it's like genuinely, you can't look at that matchup and say, Oh yeah, that's a good thing to like rate performance off of because our third string quarterback had more yards against the vaunted Georgia defense. It was number one all year than Alabama's quarterback had against Michigan in the Rose Bowl. See, but that's where I think you're wrong in terms of perception. Because if I'm an, if I'm another coach, I'm just using that as negative recruiting. Like I see it a lot with Michigan, the negative recruiting stuff. And if I'm like, I'm not, I'm only saying if I'm Miami, if I'm Clemson, I'm trying to get back. All I have to say is like, look, the high school recruits, because I don't think you can really build a consistent team through the portal yet. You have to do what Michigan's doing, where you're just plugging in grad transfers if you're relying on that every every year you're going to get the same thing what you're seeing with florida state now where it's like hey or we have guys opting out guys going pro i mean like ohio state had a guy didn't um one of the receivers he garrett wilson or someone didn't he just like quit playing the one year so like they're already seeing it so i think like you're you're looking at what what does viewers who is sitting on the bench at ohio state what does what does he contribute? What does he bring to the table for Ohio State if he doesn't hit the portal and go to Texas? Like with competent quarterback play, that was a solid Ohio State team that probably that probably has a better chance of beating Michigan. If Ewers stays at, at Ohio State, he has a better chance of winning the Natty this year than what yes. he does at Texas. Yes. But he didn't wait 100%. his turn. So that's what I'm saying. He left Texas is built off the portal like that. They had probably would have had a better chance just putting Arch Manning in. He warmed up in the game. They almost made the switch. Well, I think that's that's what you're looking at. Is it? It's possible in this current climate to do it because you're you having the Alabamas, the Georgias, the Ohio States that are taking so many top tier guys that want to play, and they're not going to sit around for three years and wait their turn. And now with the portal being able to just jump right in and not lose any of your eligibility where 
you know, a couple years ago, you were looking at guys that they would lose a year unless they transferred down to FCS or Division Two. So they wanted to stay at that high level. If they made a transfer, it was one and make an account and and living with it. Where now you're seeing more guys jump from place to place. And if you're showing, like Florida State can show between Johnny Wilson, Keon Coleman, uh, Jermaine Johnson, they're they're taking guys from the portal, Jared Verse, that's gonna be drafted in the top round this year, top of the first. They're taking guys from the portal and developing them. So you you can say you can use all the negative slant that you want. It's like you want to go you want to go to the league, transfer here because we're developing guys that are going to get drafted. But see, that's where I, I I still think the protest was not a protest at all, and it was such a bad move that like those guys like if you're a transfer guy, even if you're Dion, like he can use that against them. Like we're building something. Florida State, they if they would have just the, the I think the practice thing is kind of a myth anyway anymore. I still think you can practice up to a certain point, and even if you have the transfer enrollees, you can do that. You can still do the team trips because Michigan does it. They they've been going through doing um all kind of community things. Remember when they went to meet the Pope that one year? So like <laughs> schedule that in the spring after all the guys are back, not having like a half fake. Hey guys, you're playing Georgia. I'm not playing though. I'm working out for the NFL. But I'm gonna go get my free PlayStation or whatever we get. You know, can't miss out on that. I'll be there on the sideline while you're getting your ass whooped. Then they kept showing them, and it's like if you're because if you're gonna go and like, let's say I'm a recruit, I come to Florida State. They sell me on all the transfer stuff, and I go to Clemson. And it's like, look, Florida State's such disrespected that you can transfer there. No one's going to take you serious. They're not going to pick you for the playoffs. And even if they did, then the guys don't even care to play in the bowl. And you're going to get your ass whooped. Like you want, you, that's the worst bowl loss in history. 60 points. Backups are not like Georgia hasn't beat like anyone all year by 60 points. They did it to prove a point. That's oh, why yeah. I, I knew they were going to do that. And if Florida state and nothing Norvell could have done other than he should have just milked the clock. I joked with you about it. But, well, I mean, you looked at the end of the first quarter, and it was seven nothing, and that's that's supposedly the number one team for most of the year going up against the second and third string players at Florida State, and they only had seven points in the first quarter. Like, I, I started thinking, there's a glimmer here that if we if we could start catching some passes, that we could potentially start putting it together, and it was just the wheels just fell off. They just couldn't consecutively – too many drop passes, couldn't string together the plays that they needed to. And then defensively, there was just, just too much they, – they, Georgia just had too many athletes in space. Like that damn 86 just kept kept making catch after catch after catch down the sideline. And it was frustrating, but it's like the I think the talking points now shift to challenging the grant of rights. And getting getting the leverage on the ACC to either lessen or completely drop their their buyout so that they can get the hell out. Because right now, I mean, the, the, the biggest thing that's hurting Florida State is that they're in a conference where they're bringing in so much more money than half the conference. And when you're looking at the televised games, like they're saying, oh, the the Georgia Tech market, the North Carolina market, the Virginia market, but those guys aren't. They're contributing nothing. Like maybe it opens the market, but there's nobody. There's nobody in Big Ten country looking forward to watching Georgia Tech. See, that's where it doesn't matter if Georgia Tech comes in. Georgia Tech is a strategic move for recruiting, and that's where I think they would be a strong ad. Uh, I've heard rumors talking to some people the past week where if they're saying that they might only be interested in a couple teams from the South where it might end up being a Florida state, a Georgia tech, a North Carolina, and possibly like a weird Virginia or someone. And then adding the two teams out West. Like if they can't get Notre Dame to fill that Virginia spot, They'll just add Stanford and Cal, and that way they can do the six-team kind of like rotation. 
where you would probably have um, just for other sports a little bit more of a team where I thought because if you go to all the way to 20, uh, 24 teams, that's kind of how you would have to do it. And then you would kind of split the other divisions and then rotate through them. And it would take you a long time to play the rest of the teams in the conference, I would think. Because I don't know how you would do that. If you had five teams in your division or whatever, scheduling pod, just for travel. Because that's one of the main concerns. That's why I think they would add Stanford and Cal. Or, heck, maybe Stanford and Utah or someone instead, right? But if you're going to do that, then the the East Coast teams, I think that the negative point is they kind of already have Penn State, Rutgers, and Maryland. If you keep adding East Coast teams, you're going to kind of lose the power balance. Where if you're just able to add a Florida State and a Penn State to a pod or division or whatever, maybe a Miami and a Georgia Tech, then it's it's more balanced compared to if you're just adding – Oh, we're going to add like a couple of crappy teams just to get their states, you know, for recruiting or whatever. They have to kind of balance it out. Otherwise, you're going to kind of separate the Ohio State slash Michigan scheduling pod. And in a 12 team, divi- like a 12 team playoff, I don't think they would really care about it. But I also don't know how they can balance that out because if they really wanted to keep it all Big Ten, if you went six team divisions or whatever you could do an 11 game conference schedule play all five in your division you'd play another division that year and then you would just have a rotating conference championship game where it'd be like the east and the the midwest one then like the pacific coast and then whatever the midwest two division with like nebraska and iowa and them that would be in one year then maybe the the west and the east would be in a scheduling division one year and you could rotate it that way. And then you would kind of just cut out all the BS warm-up games, right? You're playing, you have so many teams in your conference that you're really killing ESPN. Because with the SEC, all their games are in the South. If the Big Ten went nationwide and scheduled an 11-game conference schedule and cut out the SEC in terms of scheduling, who are they going to play with their eight game schedule, right? They'll be playing games against Mercer and Chattanooga, and you're not going to get any tougher doing that. Plus, how are you going to get recruits whenever you're, all your games are on cable and the other conferences nationwide and all of their games are getting more millions of more people because they're on CBS, Fox, and NBC? There'll be an extreme power shift. That's why the SEC has to be worried about the playoff how it turned out this year. But I'm could, almost wondering, could Florida State potentially do a negotiation like Notre Dame did to try to get some of their local broadcasting rights? I think just, they would kind just, of be screwed at this point because ESPN does a lot of the Notre Dame things and the way ESPN's been fighting Florida State taught them that they have no value. They don't they're they're not going to have a partner like that. The regional one with like Raycom, that's kind of directly who Florida State's fighting with right now. So, like, would it be with CW? Would they pay enough to make up with it? Because, like, now that the Big Ten is with Fox, NBC, and CBS, I don't think they're going to get a honey deal like NBC did with Notre Dame. I honestly think that if the Big Ten works out, Notre Dame might lose that honey deal. Because if Notre Dame is getting less viewers than, say, Wisconsin playing Iowa, why are they going to show Notre Dame play Boston College, right? They're not. Why are they going to pay them $70 million a year? They're not. They're, they're a business, dude. They're not, in the, they're not in the business of just being friends with Notre Dame, right? That's why I think a lot of people that are on the Notre Dame side, they're really mad about Michigan making it. But they're delusional about the Washington, they should be more worried about Washington making it now because if the Big Ten starts pulling multiple teams getting national championships and the SEC starts losing it, that's who's paying Notre Dame. NBC, they're going to be paying the Big Ten. They're going to cut them out so fast it won't even be funny. 
the Notre Dame that can't even win a New Year's Six Bowl? They haven't won one since like early 80s or like early 90s, late 80s. Why would anyone want to watch them if now you're watching this super conference form and you could watch like Oregon play Ohio State randomly or Washington play Michigan in the regular season? Like it's insane how many good teams. Like Michigan alone, I think, has would have like five top 10 matchups next year. You better believe that if Harbaugh comes back, those networks are going to be salivating on, over that. But that's why that's why I wish Florida State should have just pulled the big boy move and not played. Did like the undefeated thing. Said, hey, ACC, we're out. We, we might not be out. We don't know the date yet. We're negotiating that, but we're done. Uh, we ended undefeated. And if they could work something out with the Big Ten... It would have been funny because it would have worked out perfectly for the Big Ten to start advertising. Like, wait, we got two teams in the national championship undefeated, and we also have undefeated Florida State coming in. Well, hell, I mean, like, we're gonna be the big looking, boys of college football, dude. And I mean, you brought it. You brought up the point too with some of the graphics and different stuff that, like, there wasn't even Clemson showed, and they're a recent national champion. It's all SEC propaganda. That's why it's funny because, like, with uh, the Michigan stuff. Even watching some of the other pregames, they they showed Connor Stallions. They uh, had Pete Thamel on there talking about stuff, and it's like, no one cares, dude. Honestly, people just don't care. If you look at the trending, it's only like weird Ohio State and Michigan State fans that are talking about it. Like the one thing that's crazy is before the game, that leak that I think we talked about, maybe we didn't, uh, the catapult system that. Um, one of the rebuttals from the Michigan side of things to the NCAA was that teams are able to sign into Catapult on their personal phones, go in at halftime, and Alabama was named having anonymous coaches say that Alabama does this. A player can log in, see the actual game footage on their own phone, and, and watch it at halftime. Of course, when the NCAA started questioning about it, Nick's no one in in the media reported it until Nick Saban said they got wind that the NCA was sniffing around and they said guess what we're not we're not using catapult on individual devices anymore. Did you see that before the game? No. That's 100% what it is about. So catapult's kind of like huddle that we've talked about for high school. Oh uh, yeah. So no, they're the one that they they spend all their energy striking down high school coaches. Yeah, so so basically a team gets an account kind of like you could log in with your own account on your own phone. But because it's uploaded to the cloud from like ESPN or whoever's filming the game immediately, players can go into the locker room, grab their own phone, and they're logged in. They can watch the film. So that's part of the other investigation into the Connor Stallions thing. It's like a couple teams came out, Ole Miss, Tennessee, Alabama – supposedly have been letting players log in on their own phones. And then the players have been, they have access codes. This is supposed to be coming because there's a, it's a little bit deeper in the conspiracy, uh, but they know that these teams are doing it because the guys that work for catapult are former Ohio state coaches that they think might be leaking the information back to Ohio state is kind of like a gotcha. Like, Hey, you know how Clemson knew all your plays? Yeah, they might be watching. We can see the IP address. That's why Catapult put out a statement before the game saying that like, hey, yo, there was no breaches. Like these guys aren't illegally watching the games. Like it's not our fault. They're just watching it because they have their individual devices in the locker room and we can track that. So now will that go anywhere? No. But if that's true, then is Michigan going to get hit because of the Connor Steins thing? Probably not. And I think that's why he was at the game. They said that uh, there are some rumors now that he's willing to cooperate. And he, the, the other sign stealing guys or whatever across the country, he has proof that it's everyone does it. And he was happy to meet with the NCAA and they told him they didn't want to talk to him. Now, I don't know if that's true. That could just be a rumor. The catapult thing, though, is 100% real because they put out two statements on it. The first time they said that they're cooperating with the NCAA. And then the second time they said that it, they determined that it wasn't a breach and that no team data is available because some of the rumors were that Ohio state was watching Michigan practice footage. 
like a couple of their coaches had access, but could, but that could just be coaches moving teams, right? So like, remember when the D lineman from Michigan, the D line coach got hired as their defensive coordinator. If he's able to just download it to his account and he has access to footage, of course they can watch the practice footage, right? Bama hires Michigan's former coach. Does he still have a login? Right. That wouldn't be a breach against catapult. Cause he wouldn't be like just someone hacking in to get practice footage. He would just have it. Now, hopefully, Michigan would be able to go in and, like, immediately remove people, like, in huddle, right? But I don't know. So will this come out? If it's a thing where they have proof that every coach is doing it, I think it will kind of just be swept under the rug. But the only reason it even came up on ESPN was because uh, someone asked about it, about the sign stealing, and it wasn't even Saban. One of the players made the mistake of saying, oh, yeah, we're not allowed to have – uh, film on our phones anymore or whatever yeah. and they're like what do you mean <laughs> he's like oh yeah yeah let's let's just talk about it it's kind of like the ohio state center went on that podcast i don't know if you saw this either um he went on complaining about how ohio state nil doesn't want to pay their offensive linemen <laughs> and then they immediately took the podcast down and then he got benched for their bowl game Right, and Ryan Day said it was a practice decision, and then their offensive line did not look good at all. He started all twelve games. I'm like, practice decision seems kind of fishy. After he complained about NIL stuff on the pod, he said that they only want to pay for flashy receivers, and he did say also that the guys that flipped to Miami were because Ohio State wouldn't match the payments, which is a bad look for them, right? But uh, we'll see how it turns out because I think. After the national championship game, some of the Florida State stuff is really going to heat up. Especially like if Washington wins it, like I said, or Michigan, I, I guess it really doesn't matter at this point which one does. That's more money going forward to the Big Ten. I think if Washington wins it, it has a little bit more power for Florida State because of how many transfers they have. And it also helps the little guy because it'll be the first time that a non-blue chip ratio team has ever won the national championship and a team outside of the team talent composite. Michigan's slightly outside of it now too, but they don't take transfers in or something. The transfer ratings is broken. So the one guy said that he could be swayed on Michigan actually counting as one of the top talent teams, which makes sense because like they looked good against Bama. So he probably watched that game and was like, I guess they do have the top talent. They had the eye test, Matt. <laughs> them in Georgia <laughs> but uh, you have anything else you want to talk about for college I know we're going kind of long no I had two things I want to talk real quick about the NFL um, oh, oh, let me make check my notes real quick um, I don't have this down on the, on the show notes but Russell Wilson dude Russell Wilson his contract where they tried to say that he couldn't play unless he took a pay cut is so illegal in the NL, NFL PA like agreements that the, the Broncos are going to be slammed, right? Yeah. So that was crazy to me. The Lions call. Did you see the Lions um, officiating at the end of the Cowboys game where they came out, ran a trick play, and then the official said that he wrote the wrong number down. He said that 70 was supposed to be eligible, so they called it an illegal formation. But the guy that caught the ball was the one that reported. You can see in the footage that he looks right at him and gives him a head nod. They're downgraded. Yeah, they I know. They, get, they don't get to be in the playoffs. They downgrade him, but it doesn't matter because that was a big game for the Lions. And honestly, um, it would have helped me out because in fantasy, I had Dak Prescott. And if the Lions would have took the lead... Dak would have had to make a couple more passes, right? Because there was a couple seconds left. I might have got another point or two. But the refs took that away from me. So I was very disappointed. But it didn't matter. I came out on top. I told you, if I win in the playoffs, I usually win the championship. My my regular season record, Matt, is like 500, right? Not that good. I'm like average. But my playoff record, dude, I didn't send... I, because of the emotional roller coaster of the game last night, I didn't get to finish up the fantasy stuff because they just sent it today. I think ESPN just finalized their final standing, so I'll probably send it tomorrow. But um, 
my playoff record's like over seven hundred percent, or it's like almost eighty percent winning percentage. It's insane. I don't know how it happens, but the one guy that helped me, I'd like to give a shout out to my boy Christian McCaffrey. All those years, you got hurt that weren't really injuries and hurt my fantasy team. What a great time for you to pretend to have a, a calf injury. The championship game. Where you go down and then your backup scores like two or three touchdowns. Glorious. I couldn't have scripted it better myself, man. It's like a Disney movie. I drive McCaffrey two years back to back, use him as my keeper. Every year he's with the Panthers. He's always hurt. He faked that hamstring injury. I still have it. I still remember the play where he just kind of took the pitch and just ran off the field and just kept going and never came back. It was like the Forrest Gump, but he was injured. And I thought, what a jackass. I'll never play you again. And then ESPN, I don't know if you saw the stat, but I read like the fantasy recap. 50% of the teams that made it to the championship game, like or 50% of the championship matchups had McCaffrey on one of the two teams. And luckily, he was on my opponent's team. He still scored like 12 points, though, which is better than a regular running back. But if he's your bell cow... Because, like, Devontae Adams, dude, he showed out for me. Brees Hall, hell of a game. I should have benched Eckler and played Ford. I was so close to benching Eckler. But I was like, he's playing for a contract, right? And typically, I like to get guys that are playing for contracts or that are, like, a defense. I got outbid for the Raiders defense. I bid $11. The guy I was playing, he bid 35 or something. One point for that defense. I pick up the Packers defense on Sunday before the game, and I had the Colts, and I thought, what if the Colts actually play good against the Raiders? I better not play them. I'll play the Packers. They're playing for a playoff spot. Packers had like 12 points or something. Much better move. I could have benched them at that point, though, but I figured I'd keep them in. (laughs) It was impossible for them to lose. I found out, based on ESPN rules, that the lowest a defense can ever score is negative 12. Because I thought, if I play them, and I end up getting like negative 20, 20 or something and losing, I will be so upset with myself. But it didn't happen. It's impossible. Only two teams in the history of the NFL, I found out, have only scored negative 12 in one game. It, it, it includes no sacks, no interceptions, no fumbles recovered. And you have to have you have to give up over 55 points and over 500-something yards. That's the standard scoring of a defense. So if you're wondering how the worst defensive performance would go. That's it. I think it happened two times, once with the Lions and once to someone else. I looked it up because I was really worried that if I blew the game, playing the Packers D and I could have benched him, I would have I cried. But uh, those are the NFL things I had. You, anything you want to talk about? No. I know we went long. I'm, I'm sorry for Florida State, dude. I really was hoping that... Uh, and they would battle for a little bit longer, or at least keep it closer, and then go to the Big Ten. Or, like I said, just not play. But the Big Ten's looking good. Big Ten National Championship. Hopefully my boys get it done. There's a lot of heat or a lot of smoke coming out that if Harbaugh wins a natty this year, he might just jump pro. I, I don't know how that's going to go. I also wonder if he jumps pro if no sanctions ever happen to Michigan. Because it will kind of just be like, oh, he's gone and he was suspended for six games. We'll leave it at that, you know. So I'm also wondering, because the university hasn't really been saying anything. They they put the contract out for him. But I'm also wondering if they have like a secret deal with the NCAA where it's just going to be like, you go pro and we'll let you keep the natty. Right? (laughs) Kind of like a Pete Carroll. Isn't that what happened to him? They just let him keep the natty because they didn't get vacated for a natty, did they, or did they? I can't remember. I know Reggie Bush lost his husband. See, that's why the vacating the natty doesn't matter because no one remembers that shit. You remember them winning it. Like you're already letting them play. People are saying that they should just ban Michigan from the from the championship game real fast and claim Washington as national champs. I'm like, you don't think that other voters were just going to vote Michigan number one because they beat Bama, <laughs> right? <laughs> Everyone always already thought Bama was the best team. They kept saying it. Yep. So they have to let them play now at this point. That'd be insane. 
But stranger things has happened. I'll do an emergency pod on Thursday. <laughs> when Ryan Day has this press conference <laughs> with this binder full of evidence. And they're like, this is why you haven't been you haven't been getting any transfers. You've been investigating Michigan still. So uh, thanks for listening. Like I said, we love the support. Uh, working on some new things. Um, let us know if there's anything you want to hear. And uh, not only the Packers have a good chance, Steelers have a good chance going forward for the NFL playoffs. And didn't really even get to talk about it because Michigan is going to the national championship. So go blue. And we will see you next week.